weather is as old as the Earth itself, yet it remains one of nature's most enduring mysteries. Few things on Earth are as awesome as the majesty of a storm. But nature can also be cruel. It can kill thousands of people in minutes, destroy in moments all that a family has worked for. This is the story of one of nature's most intriguing creations, weather. Tornadoes, the fastest winds on Earth. They can appear out of nowhere. You gotta go, buddy. You gotta really go. Spinning up to 300 miles per hour, these deadly winds destroy everything in their path. The most violent storms are a mile wide and last for hours. Nothing is safe from an attack by nature, the terrorist. <laughs> Tornadoes are the most violent weather phenomenon on Earth. McConnell Air Base, Kansas, felt the full force of a tornado in 1991. The tornado traveled over 70 miles, was on the ground for nearly two hours, and killed 17 people. It was the most powerful tornado in the United States that year. For three months every year, people across the Midwest of America live in fear of a tornado touchdown. If conditions are right, a tornado can form in an instant. When warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico meets cold, dry air channeled down from Canada by the Rockies, it's pushed high into the sky. The warm air cools as it rises, building huge thunderclouds. First, there is a deluge of rain. Then, more ominously, hail. Lightning cracks open the sky. Finally, if the storm is severe enough, a funnel bursts out of the foot of the storm and spirals to the ground. A tornado is born. They come in many shapes, from a long, twisted, thin rope to a fat, inverted bell. They may be as narrow as 50 yards or as wide as a mile. Most are weak. 20% are strong and 1% are exceptionally powerful. It's that small proportion of violent tornadoes that cause the most death and destruction. Tornadoes can happen anywhere in the world. Over a thousand touch down in North America in any given year, and one third occur in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, a region known as Tornado Alley. This is Warren Faithler. He's one of a group of people called storm chasers who make a living roaming this region with their camera equipment 
hoping to film spectacular tornadoes. But it's not so easy to find the right tornado. You've got to know which thunderstorm will spawn a tornado, or you'll just be chasing black clouds all day. Although they can last for a few hours, most are over in a matter of minutes and travel less than three or four miles. But in those few minutes, they can destroy homes and take human lives. Successful tornado chasing requires intuition, a vast array of equipment, and a surprising amount of luck. Warren Fadley is armed with the latest technology. One of the most important pieces of equipment we have here is the weather computer. Uh, it allows me to get things like dew points and temperatures and wind speeds. And uh, the nice thing about this is we have this information continuously as we're driving. We don't need to call into a weather service or find out. It's, it's here all the time, which is really important. I also have four radios. We have two scanners, which will allow me to pick up the highway patrol or police or, or civil, defen civil defense frequencies. Uh, we also have radios for communicating, which is a CB and a two-meter ha two ham radio. In the front here, I have a height camera, which is mounted on a bracket that I designed. And what this does is it gives me a shot out the front windshield, uh, hands-free, so I can actually keep both hands on the steering wheel. Connected to it is a color television monitor. Uh, which lets me see what the camera is doing, and also I can use this as a television to get weather reports from local weather stations. Tornadoes can carry away an entire house and leave not a trace behind. Or they can pick up a jar of pickles and transport it 25 miles without breaking it. One tornado plucked the feathers off a chicken but left the bird behind naked and alive. And yet the wind speeds within a tornado can exceed 300 miles per hour. And no one knows better than Warren Fadley what that can mean. It's really hard to imagine the damage that a, that a massive tornado does. You know, I've seen cars that look like they were, they were put through a shredder. Uh, I've seen foundations uh, where houses were they're just completely clean. I mean, nothing, not even a nail left in the, in the concrete. It is really amazing uh, what a tornado can do. I've seen cars with the sides of them pelted. Looks like someone took a machine gun and shot the sides of a car. Uh, I've seen large oak trees uh, reduced to just a stump with little rocks and pieces of debris. In as little as 10 seconds, whole lives and communities are changed forever. Once thriving towns are blown away, the ground looks like it's been blasted by a nuclear bomb. For the survivors, it's an unforgettable experience. We ran to the paved area underneath the overpass and started running up toward the wedge. And by that time, the wind was so strong that I just spread eagle on the concrete to create the lowest profile. All the cars that had pulled in and parked under the overpass had been blown and were stacked up on one another. And I started looking for my automobile, and I found it a quarter of a mile down the expressway in this condition. This was the bank. Seven of us employees went into the vault, and we knelt on the floor, and we could hear this roaring sound. 
and then all of a sudden we just felt like we was going to explode and our ears needed popping. So we stayed there for a while till everything got quiet and then we got up and we looked out and we just couldn't believe what we saw because there the cars that were in the parking lot were now in the bank's lobby and there was no bank left. The first storm was already up. Pretty far north. Yeah, way far north, up in, up in Oklahoma. The best defense against a tornado is to know exactly where it is. Mm -hmm. Until recently, tornado warnings came too late and left no time to escape. All up in here, all north of Amarillo initially. Now, scientists use the latest generation of radar to pinpoint areas of severe rainfall and high winds. They hope to detect tornadoes forming 30 minutes before they touch down. 100,000 thunderstorms strike the U.S. every year. 1,000 spawn tornadoes. 20 are deadly. Scientists try to isolate the killer tornadoes and put out a watch two to six hours ahead. But the chase area is so vast that being in the right place at the right time can be very tricky. Once we get around 3.30, which I call like the sweet hour, that's when things usually begin to happen for the good or the worst. Either you see the atmosphere looks, looks uh, stabilized, or what we call capped, and nothing's going to happen, or it begins to show signs uh, that convection's occurring, that you have rising air and you have clouds forming like we see out here right now. It's getting tense for Fatley. Tornado chasing is expensive, and every day without one is costing him money. This is what every chaser is after, to face the monster head on and capture it on film. In Amarillo, Texas, a storm chaser got more than he bargained for. Not one storm, but six surrounded him like a pack of wild dogs. It's an event that's never been filmed before. Here, the conditions begin to look right for a tornado. Uh, I got the uh, computer to work. The dew point is 6-9. Repeat, 6-9. Suddenly, from out of nowhere, a tornado touches down and races toward the chasers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Watch faster. Watch faster. Watch faster, Greg. He's catching us. You gotta go, buddy. They try to outrun it, but the tornado is gaining on them. Up ahead lies their only hope of safety. That's good. That's good. We got you in the ditch. They run for cover right, under go. a freeway overpass. Get up under the girders. Is that where you want to go? Yes. They lead a terrified family to safety under the bridge. hurt. This time, okay. they are lucky. It's incredible. It goes all the way up to the sky. It's going right for the next overpass. It may miss it to the right. There are seven or eight trucks, as well as a dozen or so cars, and it's heading right for But with tornadoes, there's always a next time. Hotter than the surface of the sun. When it stirs, the very air around it burns. With the power to create and destroy, its beauty is literally striking. 
we can try to photograph it. We can fly through it, but we'll never be able to control or fully understand the mystery of lightning. Of all the weather phenomenon that nature has in store for us, none is more terrifying than lightning. Scientists have known about the electrical component of lightning for 250 years, but they still don't know how a lightning bolt begins or why it takes one path over another. In other words, lightning seems to choose its victims at random. I was struck by lightning three years ago, and I'm still, I think, in the process of recovery. My life changed completely after I was struck. Everything I was, everything that I did was taken away, stripped away. Most lightning stays up in its cloud and never touches ground at all. It lights the cloud from the inside. We call this sheet lightning. But sometimes it does leave the cloud. Every year in the United States, there are 40 million strikes to ground. Around 400 hit people. Only half survive. I went for a walk on an August afternoon, blue sky over my head, just one distant thundercloud. I was with my dogs, and um, there was a one peal of thunder, and I called my dogs to me because they're frightened of thunder. And I said, don't worry, you're all right as long as you're with me. And that's all I remember. I woke in a pool of blood. I didn't know what had happened to me. I thought I'd been shot in the back. I lay there for a long time, thinking I was gonna die. I was in terrible pain. It was then that I realized I must have been hit by lightning. The storm came around and was just thundering all around me. And the only thing I could think of was that I swallowed fire. Every year, lightning kills thousands of people all over the world. Each bolt only lasts a fraction of a second but it can be up to 30 miles long, and it's less than an inch thick. It's hotter than the surface of the sun. You hear the shockwave 15 miles away as a clap of thunder. We don't even know what guides lightning's jagged path or why it chooses to strike in one place rather than another. All we do know is that the path is first created by a trickle of electricity that rushes outward from a charged region high inside the cloud. It begins as a small spark inside the cloud five miles up. A spurt of electrons rushes outward, travels a hundred meters, then stops and pulls for a few millionths of a second. Then the stream lurches off in a different direction, pulls again and again. Often the stream branches and splits. This is not a lightning bolt yet. It's called a stepped leader, an intensely charged channel leaping and branching down. As it gets close, its electric field begins to exert a pull on the ground. When that stepped leader is within 10 or 100 meters of the ground, the ground is now aware of there being a big surplus of negative electricity, which has come down on a conductor. Certain objects on the Earth respond by launching little streamers up toward the step leader, uh, weakly luminous plasma filaments, which are trying to connect with what's coming down. If you happen to be standing there, maybe a streamer is going to leave your head and, and, and head toward that step leader. A telephone pole might launch a positive streamer. A blade of grass might launch a positive streamer up toward the step leader. When that connection is made, the electrons drain to Earth in a blinding bolt of light. The part of the channel nearest the ground will drain first, then successively higher parts, and finally the charge from the cloud itself. So the visible lightning bolt moves up from the ground to the cloud as massive electric currents flow down.
These positive streamers only exist for a minute fraction of a second. Photographs of them are extremely rare. Here, two streamers left the treetop, but only one of them successfully connected with a descending stepped leader. A nearby telephone pole also launched a positive streamer upward, a failed lightning bolt. Photos from the space shuttle show us that the most severe thunderstorms on Earth occur mainly in a belt around the tropics and subtropics. At any one time, there are almost 2,000 individual active thunderstorms on Earth. One prime spot is Florida. Running across the center of the state is Lightning Alley, a strip 60 miles wide with the highest incidence of lightning in the U.S. People living here will see lightning on more than 90 days a year. One hope hinges on that cloud up there, and it looks pretty good. It's um, it's quarter till eight. The sun goes down about eight o'clock, so I can shoot about quarter after eight. That gives me a half hour, and that cloud right there just looks like it might do us some good. David Stallings lives right in the middle of Lightning Alley. He calls himself the Lightning Stalker, and he hunts it with a camera. On July 1st of 1976, I captured my very first streak of lightning, and it's called eruption because it seemed like it was erupting right out of that center pucker, and there was blue sky and purple clouds. I was hooked from that point on. But one of the other good ones I got, uh, Halloween night, 1985. The streak of lightning is actually coming up off of a transmitting tower, and I couldn't believe it. I chased, it, I chased storms four times on Halloween night, and at 17 minutes after 11 o'clock, thank you. And one of my other good ones, oh, for 1992, the best storm for 1992, capturing a bolt of lightning with the sunset, that's one thing. But capturing a bolt of lightning actually coming out of the cloud and into the sunset and down to the earth, that's so rare. What a great storm. Lightning will strike anything that stands high above the ground. Trees are the favorite target. The lightning runs through the tree's sap, instantly vaporizing it. A strip of bark can explode like wooden shrapnel and travel outward at lethal speeds. A plane can expect to be hit by lightning at least once a year. When the plane is struck, the current flows through the metal rather than through whatever or whoever is inside. In the 1980s, NASA flew a fighter plane right through the most violent thunderstorms. They wanted the plane to be hit as often as possible to learn exactly what happens during a plane strike. They were more successful than they'd ever hoped the plane's metal body compressed the storm's electric fields as it flew through them. It was the plane's presence that triggered the thunderbolt. Oh, good. 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 I heard three rumbles down the airplane. Down, down, down. For decades, ordinary pilots have also reported seeing brief flashes in the sky above storms. Their reports were usually ignored. This research footage was taken above the massive lightning storms of the American prairies. Scientists have nicknamed these flashes sprites. They're almost too faint to be visible and last a fraction of a second. They're 10 miles wide and reach over 50 miles straight up from the top of the storm. 
Nobody yet knows what they are or how the storm creates them. Their power and their effect on the atmosphere are still mysteries. But you need to go higher than a plane can fly before you can appreciate the real scale of lightning on Earth. Images from a low light level camera on the space shuttle show nighttime storms flickering across entire continents. But it's not just the Earth. There is evidence for lightning on other planets in the solar system, too. On Jupiter, it's actually been photographed. This violent flash of light, a thousand miles long, was caught by one of the Voyager probes as it passed. Perhaps there is lightning everywhere. We're only just beginning to recognize how complicated lightning really is. Despite centuries of research, we still do not understand the real nature of this primeval force. We can only hope that the 21st century will provide the answers we seek. Rain, beautiful drops of water that fall from the sky. They may be only tiny drops, but when billions of these combine, they have a terrifying power. Rain is nature's biggest killer. Floods have caused more deaths than any other act of God. This is the terrifying power of rain. The destructive power of water lies in its weight. A large bath full weighs three quarters of a ton. So it takes only two feet of water to wash a car away. 60% of the people killed in floods in the United States were trapped in their vehicles. Charles Lovett was trapped in his truck with his three-year-old son. By pure chance, their truck stayed upright and wedged close to the riverbank. Both were lucky to escape unharmed. To most of us, floods and rain are just a nuisance. Heavy showers disrupt our cities and make life miserable. Yet all life on land depends on rain. Without rain, our world would become a desert. The story of rain begins at the oceans. Three quarters of our planet is covered in water. This vast reservoir supplies most of our rain. Here, the unrelenting sun beats down day after day. The seawater evaporates into an invisible gas, water vapor, which is carried by the wind high into the atmosphere. Waves, too, play their part. They throw tiny crystals of salt into the air. Other microscopic particles, like smoke from forest fires, also help make rain. 
As the water vapor rises high into the atmosphere, it cools. Eventually, it condenses onto the tiny particles, and a cloud is born. Water in the air is constantly changing between visible droplets and invisible water vapor. So the life of a cloud is often very short. The average cloud lasts only about 10 minutes. Yet all those water droplets add up. A typical cumulus cloud weighs over 500 tons. Inside a cloud, the droplets are tiny. They're so light that each one would take 16 hours to fall to Earth. It takes a million of these tiny droplets just to make one drop of rain. Rain starts at the top of the cloud as snow. It's so cold up here that the water vapor freezes into ice crystals. At the bottom of the cloud, where the air is warmer, the snow melts. Raindrops plummet to the ground. This is Big Thompson Canyon, 50 miles northwest of Denver, Colorado. On Saturday, July 31st, 1976, the state of Colorado was celebrating its 100th anniversary with a long weekend. Thunderstorms were forecast for late afternoon, but no one was prepared for what was to come. Country musician Jerry Schaefer lived in the canyon. It was a really, uh overcast kind of, but uh, it, it wasn't raining here. I noticed that, you know, there were clouds out and we were out mowing grass that day and working on the cars and things. But I also did notice that if you looked up the canyon up there, there was really dark, dark thunderstorms, just like the whole mountainside. In mid-afternoon, a camper walking in the Rockies above the head of the canyon took this photo of an extraordinary thunderhead that had been growing all day. By now, there were 3,000 people scattered throughout the canyon. At 6 p.m., the cloud erupted into a thunderstorm. Over the next four hours, the storm poured 10 inches of rain onto the ground below an incredible amount compared to the usual annual rainfall of only 14 inches. The conditions were perfect for a flash flood. The steep rocky slopes absorbed very little water. It was quickly funneled into the canyon below. The river started to rise. Glenn Floyd owned a motel in the canyon. Pretty soon, around the bend, here came this wall of water. Nobody could believe what was coming next. In a matter of about five minutes, it came up so high, took my bridge out, and another five minutes, and the cafe and the home and everything went. Further down the canyon, Jerry was caught in the flood with his friend, Ely. We didn't know it at the time, but the dam had busted up above us, and that whole 19-foot wall of water was coming right at us. When it hit, it forced me over, and I had it in my arms, and what had happened, that whole mass of water and debris was skimming over the river. So we were in the river part, and every time I tried to raise up, that would mash me back down. And Ely went limp in my arms, 
I don't know if he drowned or had a heart attack, but I knew he was gone. And I was starting to see stars. I looked up, a large, giant white wall, a barn, was coming at me at 70 miles an hour. Hit the trees just as I threw the mattresses over my head and exploded. What had happened then, it formed a big delta of debris, and the rest of the night, the flood just went around me. And there I sat, thinking, this only happens in Reader's Digest. That was what I was thinking that night. The rain continued to pour, and the waters raged through the night. Rescue workers went into action. Darkness made the search for survivors almost impossible. Yeah, right. OK, we've got to set up another handle port over this way. At dawn, rescuers learned the full extent of the tragedy. The river had annihilated everything in its path. Rescue helicopters continued to search the canyon, picking up the lucky few who had scrambled to higher ground. Over 400 homes were destroyed, and a further 138 damaged. Search teams found cars buried six feet beneath the bed of the river. In just a few hours, rain, caused $35.5 million in damage. Worst of all, the flood killed 145 people. Six bodies were never found. Today, the only evidence of that flood is the warning signs. Flash floods still continue to wreak havoc. In 1987, in San Antonio, Texas, this school bus was swept away. Rescuers managed to save most of the kids, but sadly, 10 children drowned. Most rain is not dangerous. It is a necessary stage in the life cycle of water. Not much on Earth could survive without it. After a shower, the rain drains through the soil. It bubbles out again as streams. The streams become rivers, winding their way towards the ocean. The rain returns to the sea, to begin life again. But sometimes, even the largest rivers can't handle the rain. Over 100,000 streams drain into the Mississippi. It collects rain from two Canadian provinces and 31 American states. At the River Forecast Center in St. Louis, meteorologists monitor the level of the Mississippi on the lookout for floods. In early 1993, an exceptional amount of rain fell in the basin around the city. By spring, the ground was saturated, and the reservoirs upstream were overflowing. The River Forecast Center went on alert. The weather radar showed a lineup of storms headed their way. The river continued to rise. The following is a flood potential outlook issued by the National Weather Service of St. Louis, Missouri. Heavy rainfall is possible again over the northern half of Missouri tonight and Friday. The ground is saturated and many rivers are near or above flood stage. The heavy rain will run off quickly and may produce flash flooding. People living in or traveling through northern and central Missouri should listen for the latest forecast. Finally, the river burst its banks. The worst flood in the United States for 66 years had begun. Over 340 square miles of land was underwater. Hundreds of homes were destroyed and tens of thousands damaged. The cost was over $15 billion.
Despite the extensive destruction, the flood warnings prepared many people. Most were able to leave their homes in time, but 50 people died anyway. We have built on the edge of rivers since earliest times. The fertile land and steady flow of fresh water makes this a natural place to live. But the devastation caused by the Mississippi forces the people here to rethink. In August 1993, the Mississippi flooded the town of Valmere. It was underwater for two months. A year later, Valmere had become a ghost town. the citizens decided that enough was enough. They're rebuilding the town on higher ground, away from the threat of more floods. Rain affects each and every one of us. It doesn't respect culture or society. It destroys by brute force. Yet, what takes life, gives life. Rain, nature's most delicate and most lethal force. A roaring vortex of winds, up to a thousand miles wide, gusting at over 200 miles per hour. This is a hurricane. Its energy is equivalent to exploding an atomic bomb every second. Hurricanes are the costliest natural disasters on Earth, and they claim more lives than any other type of storm. The word hurricane comes from the Indian word hurricane, which means big wind. When winds reach 39 miles per hour, they're classified as a tropical storm and given a name. But when they get to 74 miles per hour, then they're classified as a hurricane. Category one. There are four other categories in ascending order according to velocity, with category five having winds of over 200 miles per hour. In America, 70 million people are at risk. A hurricane isn't just all rain and wind. It has a sting in its tail, another force that is the real killer. As it moves toward the land, the hurricane sucks up the seawater into a bulge 10 feet high. This bulge pushes the water surface ahead into even larger waves, sometimes as high as 25 feet. This is called the storm surge, and it's the hurricane's deadliest weapon, monstrous waves that cause most of the devastating damage. The storm surge is responsible for 90% of all hurricane deaths. The life cycle of a hurricane begins a long way off in Africa. Heavy rainfall is a hurricane's first food. It spawns weak storms off the coast of Senegal in West Africa. Usually they dissipate and die. But as the ocean heats up between June and November, these squalls begin the transformation from simple storms to raging beasts. As the summer sun heats the ocean, 
sea temperatures can climb above 80 degrees. Winds blowing across the water scoop up heat and transfer it into the storms. The warm ocean acts like a hurricane incubator. Heated air rises as a column high into the atmosphere and creates giant thunderclouds. As the column of air lifts up, it sucks in air from the sea surface, like the suction of a giant vacuum cleaner. That suction then pulls in nearby winds into the rising column. The clouds thicken and it rains. A storm builds and the air rushes upward to a great height, six miles above the ocean surface. As it continues to build, it starts to feel the tug of the Earth's rotation. Because the Earth spins, the Coriolis force whirls the winds like a spinning top, sending the storm spiraling off across the ocean. As the monster continually sucks up more warmth and moisture from the sea, it grows even larger, feeding like a hungry animal. A hurricane is more than high winds and monstrous waves. It's rain, too, in terrifying proportions. As the energy is sucked up, the winds shoot up and over the top of the hurricane and fall down a hole in the center called the eye of the storm. This is the strangest part of a hurricane, a column of air between five and 30 miles wide, so calm that you can see straight through it up to the sky above. Sometimes you'll find birds flying around inside it. These harmless looking clouds could be the beginnings of a hurricane. As the winds move across the Atlantic, they're closely monitored by satellite. So it really looks like it's been intensifying the last three hours based on satellite imagery. See, let's compare that with the plane. Once a hurricane has been confirmed, the scientists use computer models to predict the track and intensity. It's very symmetrical, and the eye is becoming well defined. The traditional model is based on statistical methods. They forecast the future by looking at current information about the hurricane, such as its location, and compare it to historical knowledge of similar storms. Before the 1940s, our best information was relayed back from ships caught up in storms. The breakthrough came in 1943. A U.S. Air Force plane successfully flew through a hurricane for the first time. New information, such as temperature and wind speeds, could now be analyzed by the meteorologists. And for the first time, they could get a precise fix on the center of the hurricane. To get enough data, these dangerous missions lasted up to 14 hours, in spite of extreme turbulence. Hurricanes spiraled towards the Florida Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico from the Atlantic Ocean. In the Pacific, the same phenomenon is known as a typhoon. In the Indian Ocean and around Australia, it's called a tropical cyclone. Seen from the space shuttle, a hurricane is a tight anti-clockwise spiral of clouds centered around the eye of the storm. In 1938, a hurricane smashed into the coast of New England with no warning. It was so powerful that it pulverized the coastline into a new shape and killed 600 people. But the most deadly natural disaster in American history occurred in 1900. Thomas Edison captured the aftermath using the newly invented movie camera. Early on the morning of the 18th of September, the resort town of Galveston, Texas, was hit by a hurricane. And by nighttime, half the city was underwater. Wind speeds estimated at over 110 miles per hour sent a five-foot tidal wave through the town. The death toll was estimated at 12,000. The city learned the hard way. 
But now, Galveston is probably the world's best protected city from hurricanes. Between Galveston and the sea, there is a barrier nearly 11 miles long, 16 feet wide at the base and 20 feet high. It used to be a tricky business forecasting when, where, and at what speeds a hurricane would hit. In 1967, 24 people, thinking an approaching storm would be mild, decided to have a hurricane party and ride out whatever it could throw at them. But the storm turned out to be Hurricane Camille, the strongest hurricane in living memory. All but one of the group perished in the monstrous storm surge that wiped out their apartment block. A small boy who floated out on a mattress was the sole survivor. Fortunately, now computers and satellite data can be combined in a dynamical model which pinpoints a hurricane's course to within 100 miles. So for anyone living in the predicted path of a hurricane, be warned, it's time to get out and stay out. A Category 5 hurricane is so strong, it releases enough energy to supply the power needs of the United States for the next 100 years. Just when you think you can't take any more, the winds suddenly stop. This is the eye passing over. Clear blue skies above are surrounded by a mass of angry clouds. But this is just a brief respite. The hurricane has only delivered half its fury. People often make the mistake of assuming the eye is the end of the storm. It's a tragic mistake. The eye passes, and the most powerful winds ravage the area from the opposite direction. Sea defenses are broken as the hurricane smashes against land. If conditions are right, a mature hurricane can grow to a thousand miles across, pushing forward at up to 50 miles per hour. Eventually, the hurricane reaches old age. As it crosses land or hits cool water, it runs out of energy and slowly dies out. In its way, it leaves a trail of destruction. Thankfully, as the art of forecasting has improved, the death toll has fallen dramatically. When Hurricane Andrew devastated southern Florida in 1992, more than 1.5 million people were successfully evacuated. There were only 13 deaths. But the danger may be increasing again. Over the last few years, there has been an increase in the number of powerful hurricanes. Andrew caused over $20 billion worth of damage, the costliest natural disaster in world history. By the time rescue work began, it was clear that the storm's strength would be set at the highest level, a Category 5. Hurricane Gilbert in 1988, which devastated most of the Caribbean and the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America, also rated a 5. 
it left 200 dead and 800,000 homeless. Statistically, Category 5 hurricanes are only expected once every 100 years. In the eyes of the insurance companies, two in just four years is a serious escalation. Scientists are worried. Is global warming heating up the oceans and in turn triggering violent hurricanes more frequently? Or is it just an unusual coincidence? Whatever the truth, it is reassuring that the scientists battling these engines of death have never been so accurate as they are today in their predictions and warnings. For once the ocean surface reaches the critical temperature of 80 degrees, the most feared storm on Earth is ready to begin its trail of devastation and destruction.